Thank you very, very much, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to review some of the findings in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and instabilities associated with it. It kind of prepares you for the next couple of neurosurgery presentations. I have no financial interests and no conflict of interests. Uh, I'm presenting uh, findings for a group of conditions that have varying presentations and varying severity, but it all boils down to abnormal connective tissue, whether it's from the abnormal collagen or proteoglycan matrix. The issue comes to ligamentous laxity, which leads to instability of the bones to muscles with disordered mechanics, and that results in stretching, bending, and pulling of the nervous system, primarily the brainstem and spinal cord, um, with devastating results frequently. Uh, there's three areas that I'd like to consider or review. Mechanically, they're each slightly different. There's a skull on top of the cervical spine, uh, occiput C1. There's the first two cervical spine levels, that's C1, C2. And the remainder of the cervical spine, I consider the mechanics for C2 through T1, that's the top of the thoracic spine. Okay, the skull made one of the top 10 structures last year. I'd like to point out that there's a, on the far right side, at the base of the skull, there's a hole, we call it foramen magnum, that's a Latin for big hole. And it's sort of important that the spinal cord comes through there. Well, actually, the skull forms around the brain and the neural structures, and it actually makes the bony skull around the nerves rather than the other way around. And the nerves don't really start out passing through the bone forms around them. And this is a CT representation. I have nice arrows on C1 and C2. Part of the skull has been cut away, but this is the closest I can come to showing you what I'm thinking about and what we look at when we look at images. Oh, imaging. Imaging is an extension of the physical exam, and unless someone's got a good history for what's going on and done an examination and has thoughts about what's gonna be found, there's really a big issue. Imaging is not gonna replace the history and cannot really replace the physical exam. Um, this is that same picture with models looking from the back of C1 and C2. And this is the entire cervical spine. The two at, at the top are, again, C1, it's a ring, and C2, it has a tooth or a finger-like structure projecting upward, and C1 rotates back and forth on it. Okay, this is a reformat image from a CT. This is a sideways view of about the middle of the spine. So I have skull on the top, I have C1, I pointed at the front end of the ring, and then there's C2. We see the lower part near the bottom, under the arrow, and there's the odontoid process sticking up on the top end. This is a rep representation. Um, it's a CT of someone who's got a normal, normal setup. There's a series of metrics for deciding what's normal, what may be abnormal. The metrics were decided upon or have been reviewed really in the trauma literature since the 1960s when effective neurosurgical treatment for major trauma, the halos and then internal fixation became available. At some level, it had to have a decision who was going to do well, who wasn't likely to do well with surgeries. This is a clival axial angle and it measures the angle between the base of the skull and the back of C1, or that odontoid. There's a range of measurements, but they're available for. Another measurement is called a horizontal Harris measurement. That indicates really how far forward or back that odontoid is from the foramen magnum, the great hole. And that's an indication of how far forward or how far back the skull is sliding on top of C1. Uh, sliding or movement be up there, it suggests the ligaments aren't working properly, and it can generate a lot of pain. And another measurement, this is also normal, is called a grab mapstone oaks measurement, and it's suggestive of how much 
pressure or how much tissue is likely to be pushing on the brainstem. Frequently, all three are wrong together, but that's most of the picture, not the whole thing. Um, this is an abnormal craniocervical junction. There's an odontoid that's pushing on the brain stem. There's the skull. Uh, how do I do? How do no, no point here. Oh, well. The odontoid and soft tissue at the odontoid are pushing on the brain stem. In this person's case, she had uncontrollable high blood pressure. She was on <clears throat> maximal doses of five medications, and she was on her way to renal damage from the high blood pressure, and she'd lost 50 pounds because the part of the brain that controls stomach problems had gone off, and she was nauseous. Uh, one of the measurements, again, is that clival axial angle. This is about what it looks like when it's abnormal. Really, it's a function of how much stretch and how much bending is likely to be taking place on the spinal cord, uh, the junction of the spinal cord and the brainstem. Uh, again, this horizontal Harris measurement at 1.2 centimeters or greater there's a lig it implies ligamentous failure. Things have moved too much. It should never be pulled back that far. And movement between bending forward and bending backward, it's sliding a total of six millimeters. That means the ligaments are rather loose. The muscles are trying to hold it up. And whenever this person leans forward, the blood vessels in the brain get squished. And when they lean back, it all pulls back. Um, Here's a grab map stone oaks measurement, and it simply suggests that there's that tissue that's pushing on the brain stem. C1, C2 does a little more than half of the total spine rotation, and my imaging for C1, C2 is simply to look for that rotation. There are cruciate and transverse ligaments which hold things together. Thank you very much. That would be good. Thank you. Uh, it's looking for ligamentous failure of those ligaments, but what we see, this person has turned their head as far over to the left as possible, and um, on that same motion to the left, or turn to the left, the top one is that axis for C1, and the second one is the axis for C2. That's 37 degrees. That's the uppermost limit of normal, but this is as far as she could go, and that's what she's got. This person has turned their head 43 degrees. That's not normal. It implies the ligaments aren't holding things together properly. That in, suggests instability. Again, this is a representation. Uh, pretty much normal rotation, normal position facing forward. And this is rotation, a schematic of what I've actually got. And this is facing forward, and this is turned, and there's facets. It's a joint between C1 and C2, and it's opening up be when it's turned. Uh, the cervical spine, this is um, 3D reconstruction from a cervical spine with the back of the skull on the top. And on x-rays, we can see bending forward and bending back. On MRI, we can do bending forward and bending back. There are limits or numbers that have been sorted through for what's reasonable and the total amount of bend. But in this person, she has a disc bulge that pushes when she tips her head back. And at the same level, there's angulation and the spinal cord is stretched against the disc. The big problem is not just the movement, but it's stretching and pulling the spinal cord with deficits. Um, that motion can be looked at on x-rays. And another problem is when bending forward, as I showed you, on that horizontal Harris measurement varying, the spine can slide back and forth on itself. So in addition to angulation bending, if it slides forward and back, 
that also implies ligamentous failure. It pulls on nerves and it pulls on the spinal cord. There's metrics, there's been numbers. Um, one of the papers was by Punjabi and White and that's the one that I've taken to use. Um, so all in all, when we're looking at <coughs> instability, there's three things to consider. We want to look at the occiput C1, see how the brainstem is upon the spine. We want to see how much rotation we can get out of C1 and C2. And we want to look at the rest of the cervical spine for instability. And with all these levels of instability, the big thing is how are the neural elements affected? Imaging can be helpful. There are metrics available to make measurements of instability. They only work when they're applied. No imaging diagnosis ought to be made on static images. You have to have a history, and even though the numbers may be wrong, not everybody is going to be symptomatic. And the big issues, especially if we're looking at x-rays and don't see the spinal cord, the brain, or the nerves very well, it's the underlying nerves have a problem with the brain stem and the spinal cord being stretched and twisted. Thank you very much.